Hi everyone, I'm Kellen Guida, owner and CEO of American Military News, and I want to share this video with you of Congressman Schreikert explaining our number one national security threat. He explains it better than anyone I've ever seen explain it. And if you're an American, you need to watch it and you need to share it. Uh, so let me know what you think. Um, go watch it and then leave a comment uh, below and let's discuss. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swikert, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, I don't know if I can top a Panetta's, um, my friend from California's great white shark attack, um, or talking about airline delays, but we're going to do something that's particularly amusing and fun. We're going to talk about why the fiscal house of the United States is collapsing. Um, and for a number of folks who've watched my floor presentations, a lot of this is going to be familiar. This is a primer particularly for our new members. Right now we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new staff with the new members here in the House of Representatives, and hopefully on the thousand-some televisions around the campus where you have C-SPAN on, please, if you actually are interested if you really want to understand how much trouble we're in, give me, a, give me a few minutes of your time. Well, actually, give me almost an hour of your time. Um, let's sort of walk through the reality. I'm going to walk through some of the solutions that are absolutely wrong. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the reality of the math. And the punchline we're going to come back to multiple times is really simple. The primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt is our demographics. Those of us who are baby boomers, we got old. And the political class here, unless we're willing to tell the truth, there is no path to saving us from a failed bond auction, a failed debt crisis, a world where we all live dramatically poor. And it doesn't have to be that way. And, and look, I know I'm a broken record, but damn it, somehow we got to get this to start to sink in. So let's actually walk through some of the reality. Um, I always start with this chart because it's just easy to get your head around. This is 2022. Now, the funny thing is, it looks like 2023, the percentage that is mandatory, that means it's on autopilot. Your members here, people like me, we won't vote on it. This is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, these things that are a formula. This percentage actually went down in the, it looks like it's going down in this budget year. It's not going down because we're spending less money. It's because we're spending so much more money on discretionary. It actually took several points more of the percentage of spending. Now, a lot of that was one-time spending will fade back down, but you got to get your head around. The majority, the vast majority of U.S. spending is what we call mandatory. It's entitlements. It's you get because you work so many quarters. It's because you turned a certain age, because you're a certain tribal group, because you're a certain level of poverty. You get these benefits, and they're automatic. It's a formula. And then over here, you see this little green part? That's discretionary. That's what we call non-defense discretionary. This is what everyone thinks of as government. That's your foreign aid, that's your FBI, that's the IRS, that's all those things. And here, the blue, that's defense. And you're going to see, I'm going to show you in some charts later, you know, my brothers and sisters on the left will throw off and throw out rhetoric of, cut it, defense, get rid of it. Believe it or not, it's not even enough money to keep us in balance. You can get rid of every dime of defense. There needs to be an understanding of reality. Your government is an insurance company with an army. And I know that sounds uh, trying to be somewhat humorous, but it happens to be the truth. Think of it that way. So what's the primary drive if I came to you right now and said, you're a new member of Congress. You've made a passionate pitch to your voters that you're going to take on the deficit. Okay, did you stand in front of your voters and tell them over the next 30 years, 100% of the deficit is Medicare and Social Security? 
the rest of the budget, according to the Congressional Budget Office, actually has a positive balance. Over the next 30 years, and this is based on the 22 numbers, with inflation, some of this is actually worse today. And we're not going to get the updated numbers until probably mid-February using the Congressional Budget Office. Functionally, Medicare, the shortfall in Medicare is about 75 percent of all of our borrowing. The shortfall in Social Security, and the reason you put that on there, understand, look at the Social Security actuary report. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat. These are people that actually own calculators. With the COLA that was just given, you lost almost a full year of life. So there's this trust fund. Yes, it's Social Security money that we've paid in over the years. It's then loaned to the Treasury. The Treasury gives special, think of this, I, um, special Social Security T-bills. And then when the Social Security needs money, they cash them in with Treasury. Fine. And then actually, the Treasury goes out and borrows other money. That money runs out in about 10 years. Two years ago, I believe, the Social Security Actuary Report said when the trust fund runs out, our brothers and sisters who are 65 and older or who are actually 62 and older or whoever are just taking a Social Security check will get about a 27 percent cut. Um, I think last year's actuary report said about a 25 percent cut. It's based on here's our projection of the revenues, the FICA taxes we take in today, and then it goes out the door. There's some data out there that says 10 years from now, unless we fix Social Security, you're going to double poverty among seniors. What's the moral aspect there? How many of this body are ready to actually deal with the political nightmare cascade of the trolls who lie, oh, excuse me, the politicians, trying to tell the truth about a multi, 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 multi trillion dollar system that's out of money and what the negative shortfall. You do understand, I think the model said like in the next 60 years, 65 years, it's like $212 trillion short. And that's just the Social Security Trust Fund. And it is gone in about 10 years. It lost almost a full year of actuarial life with this year's COLA. These are the things that we're here to fix instead of the trite crap we come behind these microphones and talk about, these are the things that destroy a society because it breaks our promises. And how about, yes, I don't laugh at me. My wife and I are both 60 and I have a six month old. We adopted another child. When my six month old is 25 years old, two things, we either blow up the debt and deficit, which we're probably gonna do that too, or double the U.S. taxes. When he's 25 years old, we have to double corporate taxes, import fees, tariffs, everything else, every four, every what we call receipt. We got to double. That means top marginal rates like 70 some percent. That's just the federal. Do you understand what these numbers mean? This was based that we have $114 trillion of borrowing in today's dollars. And these calcs were done before this inflationary cycle. This is what takes down a republic. How serious is this body really about telling the truth about the math? So let's actually walk through the fragility. And once again, I'm doing this substantially for the new members and the new staff here to understand what reality is. All day long, you are going to get pitched with people with shiny objects or I need you to regulate this so I don't get competition in my business in the home district. I want some free money. I want you to give me a grant. We get this inbound all day long. We get the crazy conspiracy theory that has nothing to do with reality. And that consumes our time instead of thinking about this math and coming up with actual solutions. And we've come to this floor over and over and over with solutions. Except it terrifies, it seems to terrify our brothers and sisters here because it means A, telling the truth about the math, and then it means we gotta do things really differently. You gotta legalize technology, you gotta legalize the disruption because it's not about changing who pays 
before I do this, let's let, see if I can explain this. For my fans on the left who love Obamacare, the ACA, understand it's a financing bill. It just moves the money around. I get subsidized over here, but this group has to pay. The re brilliant Republican alternative was a financing bill. Now, we actually did a more elegant job of spreading it along the curve, so you got some efficiencies, but it was still a financing bill. It's who had to pay and who got subsidized. Medicare for all is a financing bill. It strips it, this pays. None of those ideas in regards to health care change what we pay. They just move around who pays. Until the conversation becomes about what we pay, you can't save us. Because the debt doesn't change. And, and, and on my very last board, I'm going to do something that's a little cranky and a little mean. I'm going to make fun of some of my own work. But I'm going to tell the truth that a lot of times when we talk 10 years to balance, you do realize one of the things we're doing is saying we're going to take this portion of the spending and we're just going to give it back to the state. We're going to take this portion of spending and, and make the users of Medicare or users of this group or this that. We're going to make the individuals pay, but we're going to take it off the federal books, but we don't change the spending as you would do the calculation as a percentage of the gross national product, the GDP, or gross domestic product. And, and that's what's so important here. Unless we legalize the disruption and do this quickly. I, I had a meeting earlier in my office today with someone that's really smart, who's been here for a long time. He's a medical doctor. He's one of my favorite members. David, you got to go slower. People aren't going to embrace it. The bureaucracy is going to fight you. Do you know how many vested interests there are in the lobbyist class and down in K Street? Why, we're watching the numbers erode. I'm going to show you a slide here that structurally, 10 years from now, we may have a structural $2 trillion a year deficit. That's the structural deficit. And half that will be just interest. Is this body ready to tell the truth about the math? Because the math will always win. And, and one of the other things that terrifies me here is we're not telling the truth about the fragility of interest rates. Take a look, and I'm going to do two or three slides here, but you start to look what happens if interest rates are up. So rising interest rates could push up the national debt towards 300%. So get this. If the mean interest is three points over what CBO projected last year, which, believe it or not, is actually closer to the mean of interest we had paid over the last 30 years. So if we go back to what was normal for the last 30 years, you're at 345% of debt to GDP. It's all gone. If you care about the poor, there's no more money for them. You care about defense, there's no more money. We're basically, every dime is just covering interest. Government is gone. The fantasy that goes on around here of, let's talk about shiny objects, but avoid the real crisis ahead of us. And I'm going to show a bunch of slides that the Democrats' proposals of raising taxes doesn't work, and a bunch of the Republican ideas of, let's get rid of waste and fraud, we'll get rid of foreign aid. Do you realize every dime of foreign aid covers about 12 days of borrowing? Last year, we borrowed $43,600 a second. And how much of the conversation here is about my little Matthew, who's six months old? What's his future like? Does, does anyone here give a damn about your kids, your grandkids, your own retirement? This is everything. This will take us down. Will this body take it seriously? And you start to look at the charts. This is where we're at right now. Understand, the CBO model is now starting to look at that 10 years from now, 2032, does that may seem like forever, but it's 10 years. What were you doing 10 years ago? Do you remember? It wasn't that long ago. We're heading towards a structural cost just of a trillion dollars just on interest. Just the interest cost. Now add on another trillion dollars. in spending. And remember, 
in that 10 years, just Medicare and its portion of Medicaid go up $1.1 trillion. The total budget 10 years from now goes up, I think, just a little less than the, the CBO model from a year ago was about $2 trillion. We're spending more. We take in about a half a trillion more plus on due tax receipts. It basically means you're heading towards a structural deficit, close to $2 trillion a year. And that's the baseline. Now, how many of you ran for office here and said, I'm going to balance the budget? OK. Your structural deficit 10 years from now is $2 trillion. What are you about to do? I'm just going to move it to the states and let them pay for it. I'm going to play a shell game. I'm going to tell my voters it's wasted. For I'm going to tell my voters I need to tax businesses more. We got old. I'm sorry. But go back to that second slide. Every dime, every dime of the borrowing for the next 30 years is three quarters Medicare, one quarter Social Security. And, that I, I, and you look at the comments that will be on the video of this, and people say, oh, that's not true. Get rid of Ukraine. Fine. Strip it. But you just got rid of 12 days, 14 days of borrowing. There's this lack of ability to do math here. But I'm glad everyone gets their feelings satiated. And you got to understand, this is the baseline we're at right now. The baseline. 30 years from now, half of all tax receipts go just interest. And, and in ways and means, we call it tax receipts, tax revenues, whatever you want to call it. Half of it. And there's a model out there that if we're two points higher than the CBO model, in 30 years, it actually comes in closer to 25 years, all receipts, if we kept the same tax code, so, so all the things expire, all the tax reforms, go, we go back to the bad old days, and, and, and we have two-point higher interest rates. So that's still lower than the previous 30-year mean. Two points. Every dime of tax receipts in about 25, 28 years, every dime goes just to cover interest. There's no more government. We're nothing more than a bond house paying out interest. Does anyone here understand this? Does, does, doesn't this make anyone nervous? Am I the only idiot getting up here and trying to point out, saying this is going to fall off the cliff? Does anyone else care? This is the stuff that's real. But we're going to have a great conversation of virtue signaling probably over the next couple of weeks. And, and, and the math is out there for everyone. Anyone that's watching, just go to OMB, CBO. I mean, um, uh, some of the other groups that get, give a darn about the debt. It's all over the charts. You can get emails every single day talking about what's happening in the differentials. And we all ignore it because it's really, really uncomfortable to go home and stand in front of an audience of your voters and tell them the truth because we've lied to them for so long. And you start to look at federal government has a spending problem. Now, this may not look like a lot, but you start to look at average tax receipts. And, and, and I have two or three slides that if you ever want to argue this, and, and I've done this with leftist groups trying to show when we raise taxes, when we lower taxes, we always get within a certain band of about 18 to 20 percent of tax receipts in as part of the size of the economy. It, it's, it, there's just a sort of like law of physics and taxes. You raise taxes really high, the economy and growth. You lower taxes, economy grows, you get about 18 to 20 percent in taxes to GDP. It's just about 100 years worth of data. Okay? You know, I mean, it, it is what it is. But what's happening is our spending. Okay, you see this huge spike there. That's COVID. We went to crazy town. It became an excuse to fund every dream, every group that ever, you know, you were trying to buy to vote for you, fine. But then you would go back to our baseline, and that baseline grows and grows and grows. You've got to understand that spending here in just about 10 years, the spending crosses about 25 percent of the entire economy. Yet our best model is we might be getting 18, 19 percent of the economy in taxes. That differential year after year after year 
after year buries us. And it's not falling revenues. Look at it. You know, our models actually, even in the long term, the best CBO data still has us hovering around 19% of the economy in tax receipts. And it's within the mean of functioning since the 1960s. So there were years here where we had very high marginal tax rates. Some years where we had very low marginal tax rates. And look at the band. But do you see if I go way out, if I go out the 30 years, our spending hits 30% of the entire economy. 30% of the entire economy is spending. And every dime of this growth out here is demographics. It will be the shortfall of Social Security and Medicare. Why is it so hard? That's not Republican or Democrat. We got gray. Look at my hair. And there are fixes. I've come here dozens of times. I've walked through innovative solutions that disrupt the price of health care, that disrupt the bureaucracy, that make us more efficient, that make us grow. And we ignore them because it turns out complex problems require complex solutions. And it's not one magic bullet. Oh, sorry, am I allowed to say bullet? But it's not one magic solution. It turns out you've got to do a dozen things and you've got to do them all at once. And yes, you've got to fix immigration down to you've got to legalize technology. To you've got to change the way bureaucracies work. So bureaucracies start using these supercomputers to collect data instead of making you fill out paperwork. There are solutions out there. But damn it, this place needs to get rid of its 1990s solution and join this century. And I just bring this board just to knock down one of my leftist friends who always says, but you guys did tax reform and you cut receipts. We're taking in $1 trillion more a year today than we did the year after tax reform. It's spending $1 trillion more today. So that's like a 25% growth in receipts and revenues and tax receipts post-tax reform within functionally four years. Don't tell me it's the tax reform. Because the tax reform grew the size of the economy. And do you remember what it did to the Social Security Trust Fund? It actually gave, it saved us for a couple of years because there were so many people working. And that growth, could you imagine if we hadn't had the tax reform when we hit the pandemic? Could you imagine if we hadn't had that healthy economy, what the numbers would have looked like? And I'm sorry, I know this is repetitive, but there's a reason saying it over and over and over, because I'm trying to break through to people who've never really thought about the truth of the math. Eliminating every dime of defense on the long term does nothing. Think about that. So here's defense. Defense is going to be sitting around 2.7% of GDP. And we're heading towards a time where just, so, just Social Security and the health care entitlements out here are over 15% of the size of the economy. So defense is under 3% of the size of the economy. Just Social Security and the health care entitlements are over 15 Does anyone see the issue? But yet, I will have my brothers and sisters on the left it's defense. We need to cut it. Fine. It doesn't do anything. The scale of the dollars are so out of control. We've got to stop living in a fantasy world. I know it's good politics. I know it's good virtue signaling. You get your, reporter, or your reporters and your constituents at home go, yay, that's true. None of them own a calculator. Or if they do, there's no batteries in it. And... and You've got to understand, entitlement programs, and I, oh, I don't like it when you call these entitlement programs. Call them anything you want. Call them mandatory spending, calling them earned benefits. They are earned benefits, and it's a societal promise. I don't give a damn what you call them. It's still about the spending. 
you need to take a look at what's driving. Over here is the growth over those years. Defense, just Social Security, other mandatory, Medicare, you, all these, the growth in these mandatories here. How many members here are bold enough to tell the truth? Because when you tell the truth on this stuff, you get attacked ads, you get groups that raise money, lie about it, beat the crap out of you if you're a member of Congress. I can't talk about that, David. In that case, you can't actually talk about the debt and deficits. And Medicare, 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 I care, I mean, much of my life I've done healthcare finance. I mean, as a child, I was in my state legislature for a couple terms, and I was working on our Medicaid system. And, and even then, you'd have the experts come sit you down and say, you do realize how much trouble we're in. Well, here we are 30-some years later. Look at the curve. The curve. And this isn't that long from now. We're looking at numbers that are only functionally a decade from now. This drives all policies. If you're someone, if you're a member that says, I care about the environment, where are you going to get the money? I care about defense, where are you going to get the money? Health care is consuming everything. And look, I believe CBO in a couple weeks is going to update these numbers and they're going to look much uglier. Um, we have some back of the napkin math we've done with the Joint Economic Committee, but I used the last year's CBO number for this chart. So here's my point once again. Over the next decade, there's functionally a trillion dollars of additional spending on Medicare. If you add in Medicare, Medicaid, it's, you know, one something. Take a look here. When you get out here, this is 1.1 trillion increase. That's, that's nine budget cycles from now. It's not 10 years, that's nine budget cycles from now. So if I came to you, you saw the earlier chart, it said, okay, a decade from now, if the nominal interest rates stay where they're, they're at, where our interest cost is $1 trillion a year a decade from now. And now my additional spending on Medicare and Medicaid is an additional trillion dollars. Does anyone start to see where a structural deficit of $2 trillion a year is? Now, you promised your voters you're going to balance the budget. What are you going to do? Just stop paying the interest on our debt? OK. Stop paying Medicare? Stop paying Medicaid? Fine. How about Social Security? Because remember, 10 years from now, the trust fund's gone. Our brothers and sisters who are on Social Security that rely on it are going to take, what, around a 25% cut. Are we going to let that happen? It's coming. The number, the math is real. You can't pretend it away. And you start to look at some of the lunacy that we get from our friends on the left. Well, let's just tax more. Even a 100% tax rate on small businesses and upper income families. You can't even come close. You can't, so take all their money and just assume that you live in some magic fantasy world where everyone keeps working. Where the small, just, just, let's live in fantasy. This is what you get. My spending in 30 years is, my borrowing is about 12.4% of GDP. If I take every dime of someone who makes $500,000 or more. You, the next dollar, we just take it. You get about 5% of GDP, and that's pretending people would keep working. The math is the math, and we need to stop lying. And look, if you don't believe me, go look up CBO. Go to um, Brian Riddell, Manhattan Institute. He does a beautiful job of taking um, ONB data, um, CBO data, um, you know, uh, some of the others out there, and puts it on charts that it's absorbable. But he walks through all your solutions. You know, what if we, 
you know, repeal every, you know, the tax cuts, you know, and raise the taxes on low-income people? How about if you get rid of every tax idea that's out there? So all the Democrat solutions, you still fall incredibly short. I mean, you get a fraction of what's required. And you go on some of the other solutions that have been offered. No easy pay fors for Social Security, Medicare programs. Everything falls short. So I need more than 6% of GDP. And if I take almost every solution, I only pick up a fraction of that. The math is the math, and the math will win. And now here's the point where I'm going to make some of my own friends on my side a little cranky. I'm going to tell the truth. Many of the solutions we run around here and tout, we're going to balance in seven years. We're going to balance in 10 years. Do you understand the fraud? We say, well, we're going to cut Medicare. Okay, we're going to shift it to the individual. We're going to do this. We're going to take Medicaid and we're just going to cut our spending because we handed it back to the states. They're shell gaming the math. They're not willing to actually tell the system we're going to legalize technology. The thing you can blow, this exists today, the thing that looks like a large kazoo, you can blow into it. It tells you you have a virus bangs off your phone to know you're not allergic to a certain antiviral and orders your antivirals, allowing that algorithm, that technology, to write a prescription. You can't do that. Why? You know anyone with a diabetic pump? All day long, that algorithm is prescribing to them. we got to get this out, because if you can't have that type of technology disruption, my other is a much grander theory. 5% of our brothers and sisters who have multiple chronic conditions are over half of our health care spending. We are on the time of miracles where we're seeing cures. We, as a body, need to basically do an operation warp speed as a way to save ourselves from our own crushing debt. Bring, the, bring those cures. If it's true that a San Diego company, which has just gotten bought up, was working with CRISPR, has now cured about a half a dozen people of type 1 diabetes. And we're trying to bring out one of their researchers to come talk to us in February. If it's true, if there's just the slightest opening of a door, that there's a path there. Now, I know that's type 1. I know type 2 is often we have our health issues, what we do in our farm bill here, the fact that so much of our society has become almost self-destructive with obesity. And yes, I may have just hurt your feelings, but damn it, when government has to pay 70% of all health care costs, we actually as a society should care. When I represent the population of probably the second highest per capita diabetes in the world, one of my tribal communities in Arizona, when I meet people who are blind on that community, who have lost parts of their feet, is that compassion? So what would happen if we could marry up legalizing the technology that will make your life easier, more convenient, make you healthier? And yes, it does mean you don't walk into the urgent care center because you have a breath biopsy in your home medicine cabinet. Legalize the technology, and then we push as hard as we can that if we're in the age of miracles, cure, 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 because that's more moral and compassionate. And damn it, it has an amazing effect on U.S. debt. Remember how many times I showed you? 31% of all Medicare spending is related to diabetes. What would happen if you could have cut half of that? And yes, it's lifestyle. Yes, it's what people eat. Yes, it's exercise. Yes, it's those things. But at some point also, what would happen if we can get people, um, give them back islet cells that produce insulin again? We found a way to cure hip C. Remember when we were getting this body, when, it, when I first got here, was getting ready to try to figure out to have hundreds of thousands of people get liver transplants. And it was going to bankrupt Medicaid systems all over the country. And then Ken Zone came up with a hip C cure. And it was really expensive. And we bitched about the cost of it, except for the fact it cured them. 
and like seven months later, there was a second drug that crashed the price. Was that moral? Of course it was. Was it really good economics? Was it just compassion? Yes. I need this to become part of our lexicon, that the solution is disruption through technology, optionality, but it's also the morality of we need to push those cures out because it's really good economics. Instead of giving lists of things of, here's how we're going to cut the debt and deficit, we're just going to shift it to someone else to spend. Is this body, and particularly to the freshmen and the freshman staff that I've been trying to talk to with this speech, this will be the most important stuff you deal with in your time here. It's not the shiny object that may get you on Fox News tonight. It's not the shiny object that gets you applauded when you go into your town hall meeting. Oh, we did this. This stuff is hard. It's complicated. You are going to be lobbied like a war. They're going to spend money in your district beating the crap out of you because you're taking away their money. It also saves this country and gives my little Matthew, who's six months old, a future. And that's the morality. With that, I yield back.